You're listening to the Stoic Solutions Podcast, practical wisdom for everyday life. I'm your host, Justin Vakula, back from Stoicon 2019 in Athens, Greece, and still recovering from a cold. Excuse the sniffles. This is episode 89 with special guest Peter Bogosian, who talks about his new book, How to Have Impossible Conversations, a very practical guide. We talk about effective conversational strategies, humility, civility, friendship, and much more. Dr. Peter Bogosian is a full-time faculty member in the philosophy department at Portland State University and is an affiliated faculty member at Oregon Health Science University in the Division of General Internal Medicine. He's a national speaker for the Center of Inquiry and the Secular Student Alliance and an international speaker for the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science. Peter has an extensive publication record across multiple domains of thought. He is currently serving as a fellow for the Global Secular Institute's Think Tank. Find his new book, How to Have Impossible Conversations, on Amazon, Audible, and many other platforms. Follow Peter Bogosian on Twitter, at Peter Bogosian, B-O-G-H-O-S-S-I-A-N. On to the show. Thank you for joining me today. Oh, thanks, Justin. I appreciate it. We have known each other just for the listeners. You and I have been friends for a long time. Absolutely. Different books, different projects, different podcasts that I've hosted. So it's nice to have you today on this one so we can talk about your newest book. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. It's how to have impossible conversations. And to just linger on that last point a little more, we knew each other uh, from the skeptical movement. And all of the, the height of the skeptical movement, we were so excited about examining claims and changing the world. And then we, you kind of went down the stoicism path, and, but also had a strong skeptical vision in mind. I remained true to my skeptical roots the whole time. And I really like how we moved in different intellectual areas, but we retained our friendship. Right. I think one of the original ideas that we talked about was tolerance and just having some open mindedness to hear others perspectives rather than shutting them down rather than thinking that people who disagree with us are always or mostly even bad people. And that's one of the threads that comes across in your book that we should be willing to have conversations and have some element of self-doubt, not to think that people who are just different from us intellectually, politically, whatever, are bad people just because of that. Yeah, I think the in philosophy, you call it, in anthropology as well, you call it a hermeneutic of charity, H-E-R-M-E-N-E-U-T-I-C, and it basically means you give the most charitable interpretation to a practice or a person. And what we see happening now in political discourse is is <laughs> literally exactly the opposite. You give the least charitable interpretation. And I'm not just talking about conspicuous things like Twitter or social media posts or even statements taken out of context that people make. I mean, people themselves. We just think, oh, these are bad people, as opposed to this person has this set of information and they're acting this way because of it. And I think we, if nothing else, we would move our discourse forward by saying, okay, there's a technique in the book or a a suggestion, let friends be wrong. Most people have better intentions than we assume. And you know what? It's okay if there is an ideological congruity. Right. We can focus on areas that we have in common and have this realistic perspective that everyone won't be in lockstep about everything, right? We're not going to be in agreement on 100% of points, and we could talk about that disagreement. That's super important that you said that. Personally, in my life, I have attempted to focus when I have substantive disagreements with people on those areas of agreement and using those to cement the friendship. Did you ever see that Heineken commercial where they bring people together who have very different beliefs, but they don't tell them what their beliefs are. You ever see this? Oh, no, no. What's that about? Oh, it's just, it's just, it's absolutely fantastic. And then they have them engage some activity like building a table where you have a shared outcome. And then they ask the people, as it is Heineken, would you want to have a beer afterward? And the people say yes. And it's because they, what we're doing now is we're drilling down in intersectionality. 
we're drilling down to, oh, this person has this oppression variable or this characteristic, and we're not going up in physics, you say, superordinate identities. You know, you're not going up and finding commonalities, finding common ground, finding shared purpose. We all have to deal with the fact that we have ec- serious ecological problems, plastic in the oceans, et cetera, and that's a point of agreement, even if we happen to have different metaphysical commitments. You know, somebody believes in supernatural realms or someone believes, whatever, whatever they believe in. So we're, we spend far too much time attacking each other on the basis of our differences and not nearly, nearly as much time as we should trying to find commonalities. Right. Even in your book, you've mentioned examples yourself where, well, you authored the other book, A Manual for Creating Atheists, and you're friends with Phil Vischer, the creator of VeggieTales. It's a Christian cartoon, right? Yep, that's right. And I'm, I'm become friends because of the grievance studies stuff. I've become friends with people who that, to be very blunt with you, would have been unimaginable for me even a few years ago. People who have vastly different worldviews than I do. I'm a liberal, they're a conservative, I'm an atheist, they're religious, or even more than religious, a fu- fundamentalist, you know, strict interpretation of things. And, and I found that listening to those perspectives and learning about those perspectives is eye-opening. But, but here's the interesting thing. People will take the fact that you will have a conversation with some people as guilt by association. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So you're tainted by that. Right, right. So I'll throw, something else, I'll throw something else out that I've been thinking about. So I've been... Looking at all the people who have come out and repudiated their association with Epstein, Jeffrey Epstein, how do you say it? Jeffrey Epstein? Yeah, and it's fascinating to me that the assumption that you're somehow complicit or guilty because this guy invited you to, you, you know, his island or you flew in a jet or he gave you, even a guy who took money from him is now like apologizing, wants to return the money for a research project. I think it was at MIT. As if you could know the intimate personal details of everybody in your life. Or the thing with Jordan Peterson where he I think it was he lost the position at Oxford because he got photographed with someone who had a t-shirt that people found objectionable. Whether or not it was, you know, whatever by objective standard you would measure that. This idea that you're somehow guilty because you associated with people. We have to, we have to stop this. Mm. This is this is killing us. You should be able to have a conversation with anybody with whom you want to have a conversation. Right. And not having a conversation with someone does not make you a better person. It makes you someone incapable. It it it, it, it robs you of an opportunity to understand their view. And there can be social good in that in that if you can have good discussions with people you disagree with. Perhaps you can show that there's more nuance to the position, that there are some good arguments to be had, and maybe they'll reconsider their beliefs, especially if they happen to have some pernicious ones, right? Right. And that's the death of nuance. You know, ultimately, what the book is about, how to have impossible conversations, talking across gulfs, talking across divides. But as we say, and we being my co-author, James Lindsay, as we say in that book, it's the highest level of this whole thing is turning this in on yourself. It's like the Socratic method, and Mm -hmm. you and I have spoken about this extensively. The highest method of the Socratic method is imposing that structure on your own thoughts. So you're running yourself through, it's called the Alinkus in Greek, is you're doing a QA and a with yourself, and you're revising your beliefs. It's like a built-in corrective mechanism. And if you can use somebody else's beliefs and attitudes and thoughts and really drill down to understand their epistemology, you know, how they know what they think they know, and if they know something you don't know, so you can know it too. Or if they use a process that you don't know, then you can use that to revise your beliefs. Which again, from the American Philosophical Association's Delphi Report, 1990-1991, that idea of belief revision is key. It's central to the whole rationality paradigm. Right. Even within Stoicism, there's talk about respecting the past, learning from our teachers, but not being beholden to something as dogma if we find good reasons to revise our beliefs. So having conversations with others, looking into, quote unquote, the other side can be beneficial for us as well. Yeah, because you can't be right about everything, right? Chances are you're here. So I'll throw something out. I I asked my, my students in my critical thinking classes, what percentage of your beliefs do you think are false? What percentage of your beliefs do you think are true? Some people won't accept the question, what have you. But if I say, what percentage of your beliefs do you think are true? Uh, some people will say 100%. And so then I'll, I'll take a step back. Because, okay, let's say I asked you that question five years ago. What would you have said? You have to <laughs> scale this down. 
Right. You have to scale this down if they're younger or older. But And then they say 100. And I say, okay, have you changed any of your beliefs in the last five years? And they'll say yes. So then what happens is that they recalibrate their confidence for their second answer. And I think most people will realize that they're, the things that the, they think are true, the propositions or the beliefs that they think are true, probably pro- probably not. At least some of them are, are probably not. So they recalibrate their confidence down. But just in that example, so too it is with questions that you can ask somebody, you can help them become more humble about what it is that they think they know. Because the fact of the matter is, you don't really know what you think you know. We have We walk around having inflated confidence values in our beliefs. And what I mean by that is that your, the evidence that you have for a particular belief does not warrant a certain confidence level in that belief. Right. And for many people, I'm sure it's the product of tradition, family, politics, something they haven't very carefully considered, but they've just taken it perhaps on faith rather than critically examining their own position. You, you even talk about in your book to ask people to explain the rationale that if there were some aliens who landed here and you were to explain the position to them, would you be able to do that? Right. Thank you for reading the book. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, and, and I want to go back to the term you used, faith. I don't just mean, or I take it the way you meant it, which is correct. It's not just a religious faith. It's when the confidence in the belief is extended beyond the warrant of the evidence, right? So if you have evidence to justify a belief at 80% confidence, anything above 85, anything above 80, excuse me, that threshold is 80 and your confidence is thus not warranted, for example, at 100 or 90 or what have you. But that's why it's so important to talk to people who have different beliefs because is it true that it's an opportunity for you to help give them the gift of doubt and decrease their confidence? Absolutely, unquestionably. But it's also, and especially, a gift that you can give yourself that you can decrease your confidence in a belief. You can, you can align that with the evidence, right? Yeah. You've mentioned several techniques in your book about how to facilitate these conversations with others. You want to display an attitude of self-doubt by not being so confident about what you're saying. And you also mentioned building bridges. Can you explain that one to listeners? Yeah. So if I can take one quick step back, there are 36 techniques in the book. One is experimental based on no evidence whatsoever. And the other 36 are extensively rooted in evidence across multiple domains of thought, hostage negotiation, applied epistemology, my work in prisons, drug and alcohol counseling, cult exiting, the list goes on and on. So the build golden bridges, that that has a pedigree in the literature. And it's the idea in hostage negotiations, they call it saving face. You all, this is particularly important. It's important when it's one-on-one, but it's particularly important when there are other people present. You want to always give people an opportunity to save face by building a golden bridge. Here's the opposite of a golden bridge. Took you long enough. I can't (laughs) believe you didn't know that. Right. Like, so you can craft things so that it makes it difficult for people to cross the bridge. You can put tolls on the bridge, in other words, to revise their beliefs. And the goal of this whole thing is to, well, a goal, uh, a goal of this in chapter two, we talk about what your goals in a conversation are, is to help is to get to the truth by using the other person's beliefs as a corrective mechanism so you can either figure out their epistemology, that is how they know what they think they know, or change your own beliefs. And when you build a golden bridge, you it's a graceful way to let people change their mind. And yourself too, by the way. Right. And the attitude we're taking going into these conversations, we're not looking to defeat people or win arguments. It's just about having the discussion being charitable to the other, as we've said before, examining the ideas. Yeah, in fact, what what does winning even mean? That's why I've almost completely turned away from debates because debates are the opposite. They facilitate the opposite of belief revision. You clamp down, you become more recalcitrant in what you believe. That's why I think the move from debates, I mean, look, think about the whole atheist thing. How many more debates about God are you going to need? I think it was Dan Barker said that, you know, we would have figured this out already after like thousands of years of debates. I think we're, we're pretty much done with debates. I think right now we need, especially in this polarized environment, hyperpartisan, we need to move from debates and thinking about winning to conversing. 
having those discussions, having some more nuance, getting to the root of ideas, finding where we can meet in the middle or go across the aisle rather than as many political votes go. It's just on party lines. Are there really many dissenters? And even some of the language there, if people happen to change a position, they're known as turncoats or flip floppers, Exactly. really negative labels that are applied to people. So two things. One, what you said before, it came up twice. I think you said it's nuance. We live in a death of nuance. And so we need to recapture nuance. And we talk about that later. But the whole idea of flip-flopping, I think we mentioned this in the book. Or if not, I've published it somewhere. But the idea of flip-flopping is it's inherently a negative thing. You know, Just as a pedestrian example, we have X number of troops in Y location, presidential candidate Z says, you know, I'm going to pull these troops out, but then they don't pull the troops out. And people say, well, you flip-flopped on it. Well, no, it, it could be that at the time the situation on the ground was as such, and I had data points A, B, and C, but now some of those data points have changed, and I also have F, G, and H. So I made a decision based upon the best available evidence, right? So I changed my mind based upon evidence, and To frame that as a negative thing locks people into the idea that it's a virtue not to change your mind. Another technique you talked about was using scales in conversations, asking people about their confidence level. There was one example, I believe it was on a scale of one to 10, how much of a patriarchy do you think the United States is? Scales are one of my favorite techniques in the book. And we advocate over and over again, and there's really no extra words in the book at all. Start from the beginning, move your your way up. And scales are very good when bundled. The techniques are very good when they're bundled with each other. Mm -hmm. So the patriarchy thing is interesting because let's say we live in a, someone says to you, we live in a patriarchy. Okay, that's very bizarre to me, but you know, maybe they're correct. And you need to figure out how they're using the word patriarchy. How firmly do they hold to that? Do you have the same idea of, you know, we talk in the beginning about the importance of defining words, but let's say, well, we live in a patriarchy. Okay, if Saudi Arabia is a 10 on a nine on a patriarchy, where are we? Now, if they say nine, well, then they're utterly clueless, right? I mean, that's, that's absurd, but that's even more of a reason to look at someone's epistemology and knowledge base. If they say, you know, 1.5, okay, well, then that's understandable. Then you can have that conversation. The other thing you could do, you could do tons of stuff that's super cool with scales. And, and I use, I front load this in almost all of my conversations. Once I do Rappaport's first rule or second rule, you know, the Rappaport has four rules as Dan did and Intuition Pumps really clearly lays that out. You know, understand the claim, what do they mean, define the terms, et cetera. Ask them to put it on a scale. Scale from one to 10. Anthony Magnabosco is extraordinarily good at this, as is a read nice wonder. And you can watch these on their YouTube channels. So they say something in the beginning, they give a claim, you ask them to put it on a scale. You have the intervention or the conversation. At the end, you say, okay, we first started this conversation. You said we were three on the patriarchy in relation to Saudi Arabia. Now, where do you think we are? And then you see what they say. Did they revise their beliefs? Did they become more humble about what they claim they know? And I always impose this on myself, too. I say, okay, so this person made a claim. I don't verbalize this. I don't articulate it. I just say it to myself. They're seven confident. How confident am I that their claim is true? I'm almost always far, far below the, their confidence level. <laughs> and then I see if, if that conversation has changed my beliefs. The other thing you can do with a scale, which is pretty cool, is let's say that somebody is a you know, nine confident that we need more Mexicans, fewer Mexicans, big wall, no wall, more guns, no guns. It doesn't matter what it is. I like to have those conversations about m- m- things that are – hot topics politically because they circulate in the news. People will be more interested in them. That's why I mentioned those abortion. Okay. So someone says, I am nine confident that we need a wall in the Mexican border. You can say something like, oh, that's really interesting because I'm a three confident. Can you please help me understand how, how you got to nine? Mm -hmm. And what people will do, will do then is that they'll give you a, they'll give you a, an explanation of their epistemology. They'll guide you through the whole thing. It's as simple as pie. Here's another way you can use scales. Let's say that someone says, I, and this works well, this is, I, I borrowed this, con- I borrowed a concept and then imposed it upon scales from motivational interviewing. And I was trying this with people at the dog park 
people who smoked, and whenever I saw someone who smoked, but there are so few people who smoke nowadays, I ran out of people to ask this to. I was trying to develop an um, intervention for smoking cessation. How, you talk to someone, you build rapport. We talk about that in the book. They smoke. Oh, do you want to quit smoking? Yes. Uh, virtually everybody will say yes. On a scale from 1 to 10, how much do you want to quit? They'll say, you know, 9. The mistake that most people make is they'll say, oh, huh, why not 10? But what you should be saying is you should be doing exactly the opposite. Why not 7? If you say why not 10, then they'll give themselves reasons for why they should keep smoking. Also to backfire. In the backfire effect, which we haven't talked about. But if you say 7, they'll talk themselves into reasons for why they should stop smoking. It's a fascinating, it's fascinating. You can do so many things with scales. Sometimes people are afraid to ask people, oh, you know, I don't want to ask people. No, you just say to them, hey, how co- I'm just curious, how, co- how confident are you in this belief? And the overwhelming majority of people will give you an answer. I'm eight confident or I'm nine. And then some people will say, oh, I don't, I don't know. I say, well, if you don't like the scale, uh, you know, make it one to 100, or make it A to Z. Or, and or if they really don't want to put it on a scale, then don't have them put it on a scale. You just have the conversation. But it, it will give you a, 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 it's really a phenomenal technique that's so easy to use. It doesn't even take but five seconds. And it also anchors the conversation in something. So I highly recommend it. But it's best when bundled with other things. Right. And if they're particularly passionate about an issue or they tend to rate themselves very on one end of the scale, then likely, as you say, they'll they'll be happy to chat rather than pushing for that 10 or trying to direct the conversation right. in another way that they don't want to talk about. And even then, I would add almost always. In fact, I, I don't want to say always because there be, could, could be an aberration out there, but virtually everybody loves to talk about what they believe. Mm -hmm. They love to talk about themselves. They love it when you listen to to hear what they believe. And so, and this idea that, oh, you know, I can't ask this question or can't, no, no, no. People, people find it totally engaging. Even in the book, you say a technique is saying, is it okay if we talk about this? Or do you mind if you elaborate that further rather than being more pressing and forceful upon others? Exactly. Those are framed as questions and not demands. Like if you say, uh, please get me the salt, you're giving an order with the word please in front of it. (laughs) Could you please? And you hear people do that. They say, oh, let me invite you to do this. So it's just really a nice way of saying like, do this. Mm -hmm. But it also gives people an opportunity to say, you know, that that really makes me uncomfortable. I'd rather not talk about it, which is wonderful too. You know, that that's So I think also people don't understand that you look at the folks in these conversations as a partner, not an adversary, which is why I think the whole idea of conceptualizing it in terms of a win-lose situation is just a terrible way to think about a conversation. Mm -hmm. Nobody has benefited from that. And now, it's a great way to think about a debate, but it's a terrible way to think about a conversation. And one way to build the partnership, you said, is disavowing extremists as certain extremists we could identify in different areas and different issues that can help us in conversations. If we're in some discussion about gender and our conversation partner, again, that word partner, is going to mention, oh, well, I saw this YouTube channel and this person is particularly way off base and why do they get so much attention? You can say something like, well, I agree with you on that. I I don't agree with that view. That could build that partnership in a conversation. Right. You can, you can and should, if you're talking to someone across a divide, political, moral, epistemological, and the greater the divide, the more important it is for you to do this. You can and should disavow extremists on your side. And don't be afraid to, to go after your, your own extremists on your side. So if you see someone advocating violence or, you know, these people who want to clip this guy through the, some newspaper machine to the Bank of America window, don't be afraid to, to not only disavow but completely repudiate the ideology fueling that and the behavior, et cetera, et cetera. But the mistake people make is that they then expect reciprocity. Mm-hmm. There is no reciprocity, right? It's you disavowing extremists on your side. That doesn't mean they have to disavow extremists on their side. If they do, that's fantastic. But you don't do that 
so that they'll do it. You'll do that to let them know that you're not an extremist and you're a reasonable person. They can have a conversation with you. Right. If we're to say in a conversation, oh, I don't think there are any extremists and the person won't view us as trustworthy. They won't view us as honest, right? Well, more often than not, you'll see that the rapport building in conversations is absolutely indispensable. And again, maybe a th- thematic, a theme that's emerged in this discussion is the deeper the gulf, the more important the initial stages are. So the deeper the political gulf, the more important it is to start rapport building, like the Heineken ad I mentioned to you. Mm-hmm. Or the more important it is to find superordinate identities, things you have in common. Or the more important it is that they get to know you as a human being as opposed to, you know, it's very easy, Justin, particularly in this political environment, environment to demonize people who have other beliefs. We just demonize them. You know, James Lindsay, the co-author book, calls it an existential threat. We view those who have different beliefs, but are not merely as wrong or as bad people, but as literally threats to existence. Right. And if people are trying to shut down conversation by name calling, by not even having a discussion, just writing everyone off, oh, you disagree with me, you're a misogynist, you're an incel, you hate women, right? It's not not charitable. Right. Nazi. Yeah, yeah. Nazi grifter more. I said the list goes on and on. The whole idea of name calling so another, one thing we haven't talked about is that people will change their beliefs if they don't have a defensive posture invoked. Mm-hmm. So you want to create a situation in which you do not invoke a defensive posture. So the person shouldn't feel defensive or attacked. The person should feel like you're listening, having a conversation, gently probing. All of these things are helpful to facilitate belief revision. You also mentioned that injecting humor in conversation can be helpful. I think it, I put caution on that because what you think is funny, someone else might not think is funny. And it's pretty, I talked about this in my first book and elsewhere. Humor can backfire in conversations. You need to kind of be careful with that. Sometimes we think we're funnier than we are because we judge our own sense of humor by that our own lens of if it's funny or not. You need to be be careful. I, I would say that when you first start doing this, you have to be, I don't want to say a fundamentalist, but you have to take the templates in the book very seriously and use them literally, word by word, because every single word is a construct that's rooted in the literature. Like, we didn't just pluck this stuff out of the sky. This is all heavily, heavily, heavily researched. So, Later on, if you're a funny guy or a comedian or whatever, or you have a knowledge of history or what have you, you can bring those things into it. But when you first start doing these, really having these impossible conversations, just stick to the template. Don't get creative. Try it. Get five or six conversations under your belt. Once you've done it a few times and you're feeling pretty good about it, stick to the template and use techniques from the next chapter, you know, like the and stance. In other words, avoid but. So if somebody says something and you say, yeah, but... That just negates everything they said. So try to incorporate that. In, in, disavowing extremists on your side. Saying the words that's common in hostage negotiation. I hear you. You can put that right in the, you can put right, that right in your conversation, you know. But, mm-hmm. but the, the whole idea is you need to go from chapter two, three, four. So it's our fundamental, beginning, intermediate, advanced, expert, master. Okay. Those techniques are in those chapters for a reason. And gradually build up, but keep the template each time. And when you feel proficient at it, then you can include humor or, you know, knowledge of economics or whatever it is. But when you first start this out, just stick to the game plan. Right. And the research is definitely there. Lots of parallels with counseling techniques, as you alluded to, rephrasing what people are saying, trying to get a better picture of what they are saying rather than just assuming, giving them minimal encouragers. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm. I hear you. Yes. Right. Minimal encouragers and calibrated questions are important. So minimal encouragers are, you know, you repeat the last couple of words they said, and they need to be heard. Most people will have just conversations for no other reason than they want to be heard. So let them know that you're listening to them. Even explicitly say, I hear you. Use calibrated questions. Not always, but when you first start, calibrated questions are fantastic. I use them constantly. So a calibrated question is something in which you say, how or what, like, how would that work? So it doesn't lend itself to a yes or no. Well, what what does that actually mean? So I start calibrate how, what, why do you think that's the case? 
why do you think that's the case doesn't lend itself to a yes or no. Whereas, do you believe X? Yes, no. So you want to use calibrated questions and help people think through their own ideas and then ask specific targeted questions. And the book gives exactly the list. They say this, you say this, they say this, you say this, bingo, aporia. Mm -hmm. And open-ended questions as well. Yeah, and that's the other thing. There's a section, I think it's in chapter three in the book. I think a lot of the mistakes people make are they, and we, we advocate to take Socrates as a lesson. They focus the discussion the discussion on topics as opposed to questions. So you always want to have a specific question that you're focused on. Now, you can change that question. You can go to another question. You can go to even another topic. You can It's your conversation. You can do whatever you want. But if you focus it on instead of what do you think about immigration, which is kind of a question, but really what are your views on immigration? Like well, what do you think about how many – immigrant should this country let in? More specific questions as opposed to themes will help focus the question, particularly if anybody else is listening too, because if other people are listening, they'll be, they'll be able to track the discussion and then participate if they want. Right, right. So this should really help. And a lot of these are in-person discussions. As you've noted, the online discussions are much more difficult to have. You know, when Mormons come to your door, they come in twos. Right. Mm-hmm. And there's a reason for that. They support each other's beliefs. So I do. I teach an atheism class. And in that class, I suggest that no, do I suggest it's required part of the curricula that people go around to different religious services, preferably ones different from from their, you know, if they were born Catholic, for example, I suggest things perhaps not only not Protestant, but out of the Abrahamic traditions entirely. And I always suggest to go with someone else always better with someone else. Similarly, put people in interrogation rooms. They don't put them in with their friends, right? They just put them in the alone and isolated. Mm-hmm. Sometimes they even leave them in the room 20 minutes, half an hour, hour before they even walk in. So those conversations, we have evolved to have face-to-face discussions. Shermer, others have written about that extensively. There are no nonverbal cues, for example, in uh, social media interactions, Twitter in particular, which is kind of like a Lindsay says it's a sewer, it's a cesspool that follows you. All of these methods that we have documented extensively in the book apply to, there's overwhelming evidence, a mountain of evidence for individual and face-to-face conversations, but people don't really, they haven't grokked yet that the online environment is new. And my suspicion is that these techniques work very well and translate very well into online environments. But that's just a suspicion. Nobody at this point, there's not sufficient evidence to warrant that. So we we suggest it using the same kinds of techniques. But also remember, you know, people post on social media not to have a conversation, but to have their views confirmed. And then it's a public conversation, for example, different platforms, but Twitter is the one I use, just as a parenthetical, never felt better since I deleted my Facebook account. But Twitter is the one I use. And, you know, you can get mobbed, you can get dogpiled, you can get... So the, the kind of the rules of engagement are different. J- just as a quick note, I was in a green room. I did a, a show here, and there was a guy in the green room who was a professional UFC fighter. Mm-hmm. He's a nice guy. And he was there for – some guy wrote a book about back surgery, and he had back surgery or something, and he still fights. Anyway, he said that you know people will say things to him on Twitter like, oh, you know – you know, fuck you, you're a punching bag, or you loser. Evidently, he got knocked out in the UFC. But he said not a single person he has ever, 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 even one time, has said anything like that to his face. And I just thought that was really interesting. So when, when it's anonymous, people will say and do things that they won't say or do to your face. So the online, yes, the online will have its it's pitfalls, but it could also be good in building cohesion and building community, hopefully for a good purpose rather than just having right. mobs of people gang on Twitter. But a lot of good workspaces online where people are in agreement with certain issues and can talk things through, provide some helpful information. So online can have its benefits, but for changing minds, influencing others, having some of these conversations we talk about face to face, not always so much. Yeah, and and I think it's important to remember that you can just log off. I know a lot of people are addicted to social media and stuff, mm-hmm. but they can just log off. If if you are trapped at your boyfriend or your girlfriend's parents' house for Thanksgiving, there's no logging off. <laughs> yeah. 
Right. I mean, there's no like you have to engage. I mean, what if you have an uncle who's just being not letting an issue go? And maybe he is or, she, or he's an aunt have had a few drinks and they're just obsessed. Trump is a lunatic or he's a, a great savior of the republic. You know, whatever, whatever it is that they're saying, people need to be empowered to have those conversations, because even if you don't want to have those conversations, you can't avoid those like they're going to come to you. It's I suppose you could avoid them if you lived in a hut somewhere in the middle of nowhere. But almost all people we are social beings you ever see that show naked and afraid it's it's a show on i think it's on uh i don't know i get it on hulu but it might be on a and e originally but it's really interesting they have a man and a woman who are naked and they put him in some utterly freaking insane situation like with bugs everywhere with nothing and they get one item and they always take a knife or a machete and then they take like, you know, whatever, whatever other item, their pan or something, which interesting. And then they have the kind of the best of naked and afraid. And what's interesting that my wife pointed out to me, and I think she's just spot on about this. In fact, I know she is because I love the show, is that the reason people don't do well on that show or collapse is not because they're not good survivalists. It's because they lack community. Right? There's something about the mm. social fabric that we need. Johan Hari's work is really good for this, too, in Chasing the Scream and when he talks about addiction. I think he says, the, to paraphrase, something like the, op- the opposite of addiction is not sobriety, it's community, it's connection. Right. So I think that those making those connections and having those, Aristotle talks about that as well, you know, the highest form of friendship is between two virtuous people. And mm-hmm. so there's something deeply rooted in who we are as social beings, evolutionarily rooted in as who we are as, as social beings. And right now, we've lost the ability to make those connections and have those conversations across divides, even even within divides, if there's not ideological homogeneity. Right. And that's a topic that comes up a lot in Stoicism, the benefits of friendship, of being of another mind with a person and seeing all the benefits that can come of that rather than desolation. We we don't seek to be away from everybody else to just be this recluse living in the mountains. We, we're social animals. The Stoics knew that. The ancient Greeks and Romans have known that uh, thousands of years ago, the, the benefits of being part of a community and having that engagement with others. And having a navigation manual, right? Because we don't have any navigation manuals. And not to ride a hobby horse, but I think things are actually worse now because we have the exact opposite behaviors modeled from us. People on the, not the Noam Chomsky's of the world, but, but people who are hell-bent on looking at things through race, gender, the critical theorists, mm-hmm. all the grievance studies folks, they have made these conversations impossible. The, the academies, people are so, you know, of this whole safe spaces and everybody's offended now and you bias response teams, you go to Office of Diversity if you say something you don't like and you can't talk about protected classes, yada, yada. So all of these factors in constant on the right, on the left, all of these social factors make having conversations very, very difficult. They, they automatically put something that's in hard mode in impossible mode, <laughs> right? So the, the key is that people need to have, they need to empower themselves to know that this is not a Jedi mind trick. I can't believe I, I love Star Trek so much and I just made a Star Wars or something. I'm not a fan <laughs> of Star Wars. But, but pe- people need to know this is not a Jedi mind trick. It's just, they're, it's just evidence-based. I mean, it's all right there in the book. Templates, techniques, boom, yada, yada. So you never have to feel stuck. And uh, the worst case scenario, and there are absolutely times where this happens, you, you should walk away. And, you know, you mentioned the techniques coming from psychology, and certainly some do. Your job is not to be a psychologist. It's not to psychoanalyze people, right? You're, but, you know, good friends listen to other friends when they complain or they have problems or they want to expose you know, things that, that may be deal breakers in the relationship or you hurt someone's feelings. Or, and so the, the book is, it's a way to advance civility and keep those friendships intact. Right. And what we see on cable news isn't very conducive to conversation either, whether it's CNN, Fox, MSNBC, you name it. A lot of people just talking over each other, really short clips. And now with the internet, we're seeing podcasts, different shows where people are sitting and chatting for like two hours at a time, one hour at a time and getting deeper into issues rather than yelling at each other, where you were even a guest on Joe Rogan's podcast. He's had uh, Roseanne, he's had Alex Jones, he's had people from the left, people from the right. It doesn't matter. He's, ha- he's happy to chat with almost anyone. 
Yeah, and, and I think Joe is absolutely fantastic. And I think that's where the conversations are moving. They're moving really out of the academy. And there is, make no mistake about it, there is a hunger to talk about things that people don't want to talk about. That, that people are pro- prohibited to talk about, let me phrase it that way. We want to talk about these things. I know for a fact my students want to talk about these things, and that's why many people, of course, you know, people go to a university for a lot of reasons, primarily to get a degree and a job, but along the way, they would like some, they would like to learn something. They would like to be engaged. They would like to hear, they're not to agree, but they would really like to hear, hey, why does this person believe this? And well, they're not getting that there, but they're certainly getting it from Rogan. Mm-hmm. Right. And Jordan Peterson has been an influential voice. I mentioned him on a past podcast episode, and even many atheists have taken a more charitable perspective of religion through his interpretations. Of course, not agreeing with Jordan Peterson on all issues, but rather saying, okay, well, maybe if we take religion as more metaphorical thing and not be dogmatic about it and not think that all people who are religious are dumb, right? That's not going to be a good starting point at all. Yeah, and those conversations have evolved. I just wrote something for the American mind about that. Those conversations have evolved, and I've talked to my friend Brett Weinstein pretty extensively about that. I love this idea of shift from thinking about it in terms of a worldview to thinking about a reality tunnel, because a reality tunnel kind of locks you in, and it's a physical descriptor as well. It's so interesting to me how that landscape has changed even since 2012, 2013, at the very latest, end of uh, end of 2014. And when you read things like The Calling of the American Mind with, Greg, with Luke Yanoff and John Haidt and such, and you hear them talk, they'll say things like, yeah, they'll peg it to that date and how things have, our discourse has changed. People have become, our moral epistemologies are inherently brittle anyway. But when you try to protect people from ideas, you don't, make them less brittle, you make them more brittle. So then when someone hears it, they'll be even more shocked and more offended. The, the whole idea that you would want to, and this is kind of a rabbit hole, and if you want to go down this, this rabbit hole, but the whole idea that, you know, when I was growing up, we were taught sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. Mm-hmm. So you place the onus on yourself to not be offended by things. But we've made an institutional shift and we have have mechanisms in place so that other people won't say things that will hurt someone's feelings. But the fact is there are always going to be assholes in society, right? Mm-hmm. People are always going to say things. And then that, to use the word I used before, that threshold for what offends you has decreased. So your ontology, your kind of moral ontology, if you will, is populated by an ever-increasing number of things that cause some kind of cognitive or perceived cognitive irreparable harm. They're right. not cognitive irreparable harm. It's just that it's... The whole thing is deranged. Absolutely. And within Stoicism, that's a common theme, too. Even Marcus Aurelius wrote to himself to be expected, to expect to deal with people who are disreputable, people that want to do him harm, people that have just gone awry in one way or another. We we have to understand that and accept that rather than becoming angry and being our own worst enemy and lamenting things that we can't change. Right, or lying about it, or trying mm-hmm. to put in mechanisms in place to prevent. I mean, look, you can certainly prevent people from saying anything you want. You can put l- laws in place, and we we have certainly done that. Some of those, many of those, have been justified. But you can't put a law in if someone wants to believe something odious. And you preventing them that idea not being exposed to daylight. You know, mm-hmm. saying we shouldn't have debates because. Uh, two people who debate you, we can't have the other side represented. That allows bad ideas to metastasize. Right. You even spoke in your book about Daryl Davis, who speaks with people from the KKK, and he's friends with former Klansmen. He's a black man. He's a jazz musician who's black. Daryl Davis, my own personal opinion, you could take this for what it's worth. I don't know why he has not been given a Nobel Peace Prize. He should certainly be given one. He is an extraordinarily, extraordinary human. He is black, and he goes to Ku Klux Klan rallies, and he de- de- he befriends Ku Klux Klan's members, and he is so successful, he has a closet of abnegated hoods to prove how successful he is. <laughs> as I have, as we say in the book, and I've said before, if Daryl Davis can go and talk to the Klansmen, which is a pretty odious set of beliefs they hold, 
about their fellow human beings, if they, 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 many would not even consider them fellow human beings, you can talk about guns or abortion or factory farming or what have you, right? So we know that there are ways to do this. We know that those are effective in the religious literature. It's called relationship evangelism. So we, we know that these techniques are out there. We know that people use them. People get to know D- Daryl Davis as a good dude, right? As a guy who's an accomplished musician. He's just like you and me. He's just a guy who happens to have black skin, right? So mm-hmm. when people know that, and he talks to them, and, and when you watch him talk to them, it's really interesting. He just has an intuitive knack for many of the techniques that are in the book. So he is a model, and we hold him up as a model because he should be. And to revisit something we mentioned earlier about modeling doubt, modeling the fact that we've changed our minds, are there particular issues that you can think of on this spur of the moment that you've changed your mind about in the past few months or years? Yeah, I can think of a lot of issues. One uh, I was told my whole life that breakfast was good for me and we need to eat three meals a day with the biggest one being in the morning. Well, I found out from my physician I'm pre-diabetic, even though I'm not fat. It's from my Crohn's disease. I did like everybody else should, the basis of scientific skepticism. Um, I tried intermittent fasting, but before I tried, I pre-tested, intermittent fasted, and then post-tested. And that's a belief that I changed. I've changed beliefs about, I've changed so many beliefs. I've changed beliefs about people. I've changed beliefs about, boy, I I can't even, I'm trying to think of what my beliefs have been stable about. Uh, I think as I get older, it's granted me a real privilege of, you know, this is in philosophy, there's a phrase, subspecie eternitatis, like under the watchful eye of eternity. Like, Mm -hmm. I feel that I'm, I've been glimpsing how society and beliefs change and patterns of behavior change. And I've noticed that I, as much as I try to formulate my beliefs on the basis of evidence and reason, I often find myself, even if I, I've kind of, I speak about this extensively, I've kind of miscalibrated my own beliefs higher than I, I should have on certain things. So yeah, the the short answer to that is yes. The big one is for me, it's how I live my life every day. I've also changed my my mind in the last few years about animals, sentience, feeling pain, etc. I, I I do not eat factory farmed meat now. I do not think it it is um, an ethical thing to do. So I've changed my mind about the epistemic status of animals. Good. So those things can help in a conversation where you can mention, well, look, I've changed my mind on this. You've mentioned in the book too, oh, I used to think this, but this particular thing changed my mind. Or I had this interaction with an individual from a certain belief or a group. Right. That's an example of building golden bridges. And the other thing we say in the book is if you're having a conversation with someone and you're like, they said something that you just didn't think of and it was a really interesting reason, Say it. Say, wow, that's cool. I never thought about that. You know, or change your mind on the spot. You almost never see that in real time. Talk Mm -hmm. about a rapport builder. That's the ultimate rapport builder. Right, right. Or just to pose a counterexample in some ways by saying, okay, what if this happened? Where some people would say, oh, I always would do that. I always would think that. And ask them, try to find what you called in previous works, what defeasibility test to see if there are any circumstances in which they would change their views. Right. So the I think it was the publisher told us not to use that word. <laughs> uh, so we called we called it. I was going to label my first book Street Epistemology, but I think my publisher told me if you put the word epistemology in the book, no one's going to buy it. And we originally well, the, this comes from applied epistemology and very esoteric. It's from the d- defeasibility. It deals with doxastic closure from the Greek doxa, which means belief. But instead of doxastic, we use the word disconfirmation because that's uh, nobody has ever even heard the word defeasible. Even people in philosophy haven't heard it. It's such a niche area of not just philosophy. It's a niche area of epistemology. But disconfirmation, you know, from popper, dis- disconfirmability, and to confirm, everybody knows that, and they know the word dis, and they put the word dis in front of confirm, you can pretty much figure it out. But the dis, a disconfirmation question or a defeasibility question is, under what conditions would that belief be false? That's the subject for a whole nother podcast, but I found that technique one of the most powerful techniques for helping people think about their beliefs. And the mistake people make is they ask, particularly in, in philosophy, well, how do you know that's true? And they 
explain how they know it's true and they've rehearsed it and they hear themselves saying it and it just, they recalibrate their confidence up. But if you, instead of that, if you just, there's nothing wrong with the question, how do you know know that? It's, you know, Socrates' question. It's a great question. But just swip, flip the order. So just ask a defeasibility question before you, or excuse me, ask a disconfirmation question uh, before you ask a question about how someone knows what they they think they know. And that simple flipping of the order is big, but it's like these things work best in suites. Once you've done chapter two and three, combining scales with disconfirmation is just money in the bank. It is a nuclear bomb, someone's cognitions. Writing every day and um, really appreciative of the opportunity you gave me to talk to you about the book. And I'm very grateful that you read it. You know, so many times I have interviews and people have never read the book and I don't understand why I'm being interviewed about the book. <laughs> but yeah. I appreciate the fact that you read it carefully. Yeah, you can find me on Twitter at Peter Bogosian, P-E-T-E-R-B-O-G-H-O-S-S-I-A-N. And, you know, we have tons of stuff coming up. You can find the book anywhere, How to Have Impossible Conversations. It's on Amazon. It's all over the place. So appreciate that. Thanks for listening and stay tuned for more content. Also listen to my newest podcast project, the Hurdy Gurdy Travel Podcast, in which I discuss how to travel the world at next to no cost with credit card rewards programs at hurdygurdytravelpodcast.com for more information, including a credit card questionnaire, which will help me guide you in the right direction. Visit my website at stoicsolutionspodcast.com, where you can email me, connect with me on social media, find past episodes, and join my Discord chat server for interactive discussion. Support my work through Patreon, PayPal, the Cash App, and referral links by visiting the Donate tab on my website. Podcast music, used with permission, is brought to you by Phil Giordana's symphonic metal group Fairyland from their album Score to a New Beginning. John Bartman offered free consultation and audio edits for episodes 51 through 63. Thanks to generous patrons and fans of this podcast who help support my work. Have a great day.